But the scripture says in Matthew 24, it talks about this is the beginning of sorrows. You know, and you know, Gowdy walked up this morning and he said the same thing. And that's just what the Lord had already been putting on my heart. And so once again, I mean, Gowdy and myself, we may both be proven to be wrong. And if that be the case, praise God for another sunny day tomorrow. Amen. But if not, we need to be prepared. Amen. Amen. Look, I, I got to be honest with you. I didn't even realize till like about two days ago that today was uh, Palm Sunday. <laughs> Amen. And I want to encourage you to tune in at 2.30 because Sister Angie's going to be preaching on Palm Sunday. Amen. To the children. And one of the things that I noticed last week was that she was teaching the word of God. I was thinking to myself, I didn't say anything because I was kind of like responding on the little Facebook thing. But I was thinking that might sound a little bit uh, arrogant if I did that. So I didn't do it. But I almost put on there, this girl's teaching our children deeper thoughts than many senior pastors teach their people regarding the truth of the gospel. I just said it out there like that, but that just is what it is. She was teaching them on what it means to be in Christ. She was teaching them on what it means to truly be baptized into Christ, Romans chapter 6. And I mean, she broke it down at a level that I'm telling you right now that anybody could have understand it, understood it, but people needed to hear it. Amen. Listen, uh, one other thing I wanted to kind of share with you is, is that I apologize, but I forgot my, I don't have my iPad. And uh, so I'm going to be switching back and forth between my notes. So don't get frustrated. And if you happen to chime in, I don't know that you will, but if you do, don't be like writing on there. Oh, we can't read. The, the notes weren't really for you to have to see. So I'm going to go back and forth between my notes and the scripture. Amen. Praise God. I titled this morning's message, The the Curse Will Be Reversed. Amen. I, I do want to say this, though, that even though this morning is not really a Palm Sunday message, if you think about the whole concept behind Palm Sunday, I do believe that much of my message, and I'm just really trying to follow the lead of the Lord. The Lord put on my heart about a month or so ago a scripture that said, for such a time as this. And lo and behold, whenever I went back to the book of Esther and I began to read through and I explained a little bit of this last week, I began to realize that the, that the book of Esther was coming across as a prophetic outline, if you will, and that's what I've been following along with and feeling as though the Lord, this is the last installment, next week we will preach on Resurrection Sunday, amen, a resurrection message, but as I've been following through, I've just really been desiring to hear the voice of God and what he would have me to say in the midst of this, because I know that he put this concept on my heart for such a a time as this. And if you think about Palm Sunday, what was really happening on Palm Sunday is, is that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords came into town lowly and riding on the donkey. That's what the prophet Zechariah prophesied hundreds of years in advance that that's what he would do. And so he came into town riding lowly on a donkey. Hallelujah. The word of God says in Revelation 19 that he's going to return one day and he won't be on a lowly donkey and he's not going to be as a suffering sa savior but it, or like a sacrificed lamb. He's going to come back as a conquering king on a white stallion. But on that day, he was indeed the king of kings and the lord of lords. He rode into town, into heading into Jerusalem on this donkey. The people began to worship him. Now, but, but if you understand the context, you got to understand they weren't worshiping for the reason that they should have been. Right. I'm just being perfectly honest with you. They wanted a king that was going to deliver them from the tyranny of Rome. Right. And many times people want to be delivered from the tyranny or the frustration that they're facing. But nevertheless, they realized he was the son of David and they cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna, and blessed be the, the son of David. And the Pharisees and the religious leaders became frustrated and they said, tell your people to shut their mouth. And that's when Jesus said, if I tell them to stop, then the rocks are going to cry out because I'm here to tell you that all creation groans longing for the redemption of the son of man. Hallelujah. Longing for the day when Jesus will be exalted and magnified and he will sit upon the throne that belongs to him because he is the king of kings yes. and the lord of lords but listen you know what jesus said jesus said this himself he said that he said you won't receive me i come in my father's name but another will come in his own name and him you shall receive so in a certain way my message this morning is kind of like that because it's a story of a king and it's a story of 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 one that is not of god being elevated 
and trying to persecute people. But in the end, God's people, hallelujah, gain victory. In the end, God's people are exalted because God has chosen to exalt them. I got to be honest with you before we get started. I know that I've already done a lot of talking, but let me just say this. There's a portion of my message this morning that's a little deeper than normal for a Sunday morning message. I'm not going to apologize for it. I'm <laughs> preaching what the Lord put on my heart this morning. I usually reserve stuff like this for my Wednesday night crowd, though. But guess what? You're going you're gonna to get a little bit of it this morning. Amen. So that's going to be whenever we get into the book of Revelation a little bit. But the title of this morning's message is The Curse Will Be Reversed. I got, a, I got an encouraging word, even though maybe some parts of my message this morning might be questionable on whether or not it's encouraging or the way that you want it. The, la the end result is it's an encouraging word from God because the curse will be reversed. Amen. One way or another, God is going to win in the end, hallelujah, and his people that are called by his name that endure until the end, hallelujah, will be blessed. Amen. Amen. This is the last installment of the series for such a time as this. Amen. One thing that most sensible Christians understand is that God certainly did not create this virus. God is not the author of death and disease. Death and disease are the result of sin, which is authored by Satan and entered into by man, and the fruit of it is death. God doesn't waste anything, though. Amen? And just as he allowed tribulation in Job's life, he's allowing this to happen on earth, and he always desires for his people that are called by his name to pray, to turn from their wicked ways, and to look to him, and to trust him and his plan for the human race. It may not always turn out exactly the way we expected, church. I'm just being honest with you. Many times we look into the scriptures hoping to find the answers that we desire to hear. And there's been many times when I've looked into the scripture that it ended up, I believe it was saying something different than what I expected it to say. I learned this in Bible college, and I'm not trying to get all fancy on you, but, you know, and then, well, let me just give you two words. I'm going to go ahead and do it. I learned two words in Bible college. You ready? Exegesis and eisegesis. What does this mean? This word ek in the Greek means out of. This word ice right here in the Greek means into. So what that's saying is two different ways that you can look at the word of God. Exegesis is when you pull out of the word of God what's actually contained there. See, that goes back to the word that the Lord gave me when I was in that barroom bathroom however long ago. I didn't realize it then because I didn't even know the word. The Lord said, present my word for the way that it is written. Right. So what the Lord began me on a journey was to find out what he actually was saying, to find out what it was and to pull that out. Right. Rather than to eisegete, which means to look into. What that means is, is that I come to the word of God with my own pre-planned, formulated ideas of what it says. And I just read it like I always did. Because, oh, this is what I know this is saying. And whenever I get into it, it's like I don't change my mind. I don't really let the word of God speak because I already have it preordained what it's saying. Because other people have told me in advance what it was saying. And I chose to believe them because it was a good story that sounded good and it ended the right way in the end. Well... I'm here to challenge you this morning. I'm not here to tell you or to ask you to believe everything that I'm going to say or whatever the case. I know I'm going to tell you like a Berean, like the Apostle Paul said to the children, uh, to those. And he said those in Thessalonica were those in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they took the scriptures that Paul taught them and they went home and they studied them for themselves. And so, listen, there would, it doesn't always turn out exactly the way we expect it. But I can assure you that no matter what happens, God wasn't taken by surprise. And I can tell you something else. There would have been portions in his word, I believe this with all of my heart, that would have prepared us had we been willing to read his word and understand it for the way that it was written. Not read it and understand it for what we wanted to see. I believe that God's plan, God's word is an open book. A prophetic, within it contains a prophetic outline to prepare us for what it is that we would be facing. Amen. See, personally, for me, that's what I saw in the book of Esther. I'd never seen it before. Like a prophetic outline that clearly mapped out the church age and the end days as I turned the pages. That's what I believe. This is what we're going to finish with this morning. Esther chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Amen. Esther 3, verses 1 and 2. It says, after these things, 
did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite? Now listen, last week I told you you can't make this stuff up. I don't know if you were with me last week, but I told you that Haman means, his name literally means the magnificent one. And the title of his culture where he was from, the Agagite, literally means that I will overtop. And so you can't get a better picture of the Antichrist than this right here because, the, because Satan himself believes himself to be the magnificent magnificent one and he said according to the prophetic literature that he said I will exalt myself above the throne of God and so we see in Haman a type of the Antichrist and advanced him so that but, but look I, I made this point to you last week it's the king that's doing this I don't mean to be redundant but I'm just trying to give you the overall context because where we've been backwards in the book of Esther is is that we saw that that Vashti Queen Vashti was summoned to come to a to a feast but what she chose to do was she chose to create her own feast and she refused to come to the king's feast and one of the things that I said was, is that, listen, in the church that we live in today, there's many that are preparing their own feast. It looks like the king's feast, but it's not the king's feast. And it looks exactly like it. And just like the modern church, is, we're, we've been playing church. We show up, people show up on Sunday, and we got people standing behind pulpits and they're using portions of scripture. But it's not really what the Lord is, has called us to do because we've been taking the scripture out of context. And we've watered down the word of God and we've diluted it and we've created a seeker sensitive environment to prepare people to feel comfortable inside the walls of the church, inside the chairs of the church and, and, and we've watered it down so that they'll keep coming back and don't tell me that that's not true because I know that it is and, and so Queen Vashti refused and she represents those that would refuse the call of the king. But yet Queen Esther, she, she, when she was summoned, she came. Amen. And we see that from in the midst of the church age, the Holy Spirit has been calling. And as the Holy Spirit has been calling, some have refused and some have hearkened or listened to the voice of the Lord. And they've bowed down, <laughs> excuse me, and chosen to serve the king. And so we see Haman as a type of antichrist. And the king advanced them. See, the, what I, the point that I made last week was our second installment in this particular series. I made the point that when the first seal in the book of Revelation is opened up, that there's a rider on a white horse. He has a bow without arrows. He comes in peace. He doesn't come causing war immediately. The book of Daniel chapter 9 talks about the fact that, that he will create a covenant with his people. It's a peace agreement. But in the middle of that covenant, he will break it and he will bring great deception upon the world. That's talking about the Antichrist. See, when the first seal is opened and the only one that was worthy to open the seal was Jesus, who was the, who was the true rider on the white horse. But now we see in the first seal a counterfeit. So one of the things that we need to understand also, if we're going to understand the seals, and that's not real, I guess it is what I'm preaching, but once again, I'm connecting it to Esther. If we're going to understand the seals, then we need to understand that before the wrath of God is poured out, when we're getting close to seal number six, everything else really could be man-made. What I'm trying to say is, is that even in the midst of tribulation, once the first seal is open and the Antichrist comes, pestilences, I'm not saying that they are, but they could be man-made. Pestilence, famine could be man-made. Now, I'm not saying that it is, but it could be. Famine, wars, rumors of wars, all this can be man-made, but you cannot, man cannot cause stars to fall from the sky. Man cannot cause the moon to turn like blood and for the sun to become black like sackcloth. I'm here to tell you this morning that there's a big difference between tribulation and the wrath of God and the apostle Paul called us he said this you were not appointed in the wrath see you don't have to experience the wrath of God hallelujah I'm not saying you don't have to experience tribulation I'm listening to me don't don't like shout me down when I'm preaching good oh you're trying to say no I'm not don't I'm not even gonna say it I'm just what I'm trying to tell you is this the people of God have always had to experience tribulation have they not 
We have been spoiled in our American mindset. We've been sitting back watching TV, eating cotton candy, thinking that nothing could ever touch us because of our Constitution. Listen, the Constitution is not the word of the Lord. Jesus wasn't an American. Did Jesus create this nation? Absolutely. I believe that with all of my heart. Why? So that missionaries could be sent abroad. So that the gospel of Jesus Christ could be preached. Hallelujah. But that does not mean that Americans cannot be touched also with hard times. Come on, somebody. We need to wake up. We need to be prepared. We need to understand Jesus loved the people in Mexico just as much as he loves the people in America. And already the people in Mexico, their churches are completely shut down. So listen to me. We need to be aware. We need to have our eyes wide open. The point that I'm trying to make, though, is, is that in the end, when the seal is open, God allows the Antichrist to rise to power. You need to understand that. Well, why would God allow it? Because the end must come whenever that shall be. Are you saying, preacher, that this is that? No, I'm not. I've already made myself clear. I'm not. But I believe that this is burning in my heart. And I believe that I'm supposed to explain to you the things that is burning in my heart. To prepare whoever would be willing to listen for what may lie ahead in the future. Am I prophesying that this is the... No, that's not what I'm prophesying. I'm prophesying the word of God. Out of the book of Esther, a prophetic outline that says... The king elevated Haman, the magnificent one who said that he would overtop. I'm here to tell you that one day God is going to allow the Antichrist to rise to power for a greater purpose. <clears throat> the greater purpose is going to be because the end shall come. And in the end, Jesus Christ will be victorious. In the end, he will not be riding on a donkey, but instead he will be riding on a white stallion. He will be a conquering king, and on his thigh it will say, Lord of lords and king of kings, and out of his mouth shall come a two-edged sword, and it will smite the nations. All those that refuse to bow their knee on the front end will bow their knee on the back end, and he will be glorified and magnified for who he truly was, which was the son of the living God, and the truth, well, that's what the word revelation means. It means apocalypsis. It means to be revealed. It's almost like there was a statue that was covered with a sheet, and the whole time nobody could really, really, really see it. The only people that could see it were those whose eyes were open to believe it was real. But then it's going to come a day, whoo, and he's going to pull the sheet off, and he's going to reveal it to the whole world. And you'll no longer be questioning whether or not the word of God was real. You're going to know it's real. You're going to know it's real because it's going to be open and manifest for your eyes to see. And hopefully at that point in time, it won't be too late. Amen. Child of God. So he set his seat above all the princes that were with him. We're still in Esther right here, chapter 3, look at verse 2. All the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman. For the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai bowed not, nor did he give him reverence. Listen to me, child of God. Whether it's tomorrow, whether it's next week, whether it's three years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. When the word of God gives us details along the way to prepare his people, like when Nebuchadnezzar, I know I already said it, but I'm going to say it again, prepared a golden image and said, when you hear the sackcloth, the psaltery, the flute, when you hear the dulcimer, everybody bow down to the image that the beast has created and you will bow down and you will reverence and you will worship and the three Hebrew boys said no we won't we're not going to bow down we're not going to worship your image king because the God we serve is able to deliver us from this fire and furnace but guess what even if he won't Hallelujah. we're not going to bow down we're not going to bow down to your image we're not going to bow down and give allegiance to a false God and a false Image and Mordecai is a type of the child of God in the end days says I will not bow down to this who calls himself the magnificent one to this who says that he's going to overtop above the throne of God oh help us Lord help us Lord so in last week's message once again I made the point that Haman was a type of antichrist that he would have been allowed a certain amount of time to exert power over the inhabitants of the earth. And while there's already an aspect of Satan having influence over the world, listen to me, 
Jesus recognized him. For sake of time, I'm not going to turn to all these scriptures, but I got a list of scriptures if you're taking notes. John 12, 31. John 14, 30. John 16, 11. Jesus called Satan the prince of this world. The, world, the word world there is cosmos. The word can describe the globe that we live on, but more specifically, the context has to do with the inhabitants of the world. Now, I want you to see that there is a scripture that I want you to look at real quick with me regarding this thing. Because, see, this is a message for some of you out there that you may have been refusing the word of the Lord. You may, maybe God has sent people in your pathway and they have tried to talk to you about the gospel and you have just rejected the message. Or there's a part to you that's been struggling with it. Maybe you haven't completely rejected it. Maybe there's parts to you that says, man, that does seem right. But yet at the same time, you've chosen to try your own journey because that's just what you want to do right now. But I got to tell you that Jesus said the prince of this world. I got to tell you that the same spirit of Antichrist that will be at the end has been exerting his influence over the world since the beginning of time. It was the spirit of Antichrist that caused Adam and Eve to fall. It was the spirit of Antichrist that put the lie in Cain's heart. It was the spirit of Antichrist that tried to make the Hebrew boys bow down. It's the spirit of Antichrist that's in Haman that's trying to cause Mordecai to also bow down. And it's the, and it's the same spirit that Jesus talked about when he refers to the prince of this world. Now I want you to see in Ephesians chapter 2. You ready? I want you to see this spirit because this spirit is causing delusion in the world. This is what the Apostle Paul is saying to the church of Ephesus. He says, and you, talking about you out there that now are converted. If you're a believer, he's talking to you. Amen. You has he quickened. That's old King James for meaning he's given you life. Who were dead in trespasses and sin. You know that before you gave your heart to Jesus, you were dead in sin. Amen? Amen. But look at this. In the past, where in times past, you walked according to the course of the world. See, the right. world is walking a particular course. According to the prince of the power of the air. That's Haman right there. Haman, the spirit of Antichrist, exerting his influence over the world. He's the prince of the power of the air. Jesus said he's the prince of this world. There's a, there's a collection of people that have refused to bow their knee to Jesus that are under the influence of the spirit of Antichrist. Much of the modern church is under the spirit of Antichrist. The word of God says that not me. The apostle Paul told Timothy to be aware that the spirit not Matt, not the Apostle Paul. The Spirit expressly says that in the last days, some will depart from the faith and give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. He says right here that the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Among whom also, he's saying, listen, he's saying, don't get all high and mighty now. Don't get all self-righteous. Don't start looking down your religious nose at everybody else around you. Because look, among whom, see, you used to be one of them. Mm -hmm. Also, we all had our conversation, all of our lifestyle in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Believe it is. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us. He's given us life together with Christ, for it is grace that you've been saved. And look at this. He's raised us up together. He's made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I got good news for you, child of God. I got news for you, unbeliever. All you got to do is give your heart to Jesus. All you got to do is say, yes, Lord, I believe that the story is true. I believe, Father, you sent Jesus to die for me, and I put my faith in that, and I repent of my sin, and I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and you too, according to the word of God, can be seated in Christ in heavenly places. Right now, yeah. right at this moment in the spiritual realm, the word of God says that it's a done deal and we're already with him. Amen. Don't get me wrong. The game got to be played. It's got to be played out. But according to God, it's already done. According to God, it's already been won. That's why Jesus said it is finished. Jesus defeated the principalities and powers. But guess what? He, he, he allows you and I to partake. Amen? Amen. And he allows us to be part of what it is that he's doing. Praise God. So listen, that's what this Haman is a type of. 
power of evil has been present on the earth, but there will come a day when God will allow Satan to exert more power over the earth for a short period. And that was what we discussed last week. Amen. But see, it's the same spirit. It's whenever people's, God's people face in untoward situations that even though the spirit of Antichrist is trying to exert himself and he becomes more, listen, when we get closer to the end, it's going to get worse. Oh, but, but preacher, I thought that we were going to be raptured out of here, but you might be raptured out of here. I'm not here to teach you a pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib. That's not what I'm doing here. I'm just trying to remind you, American, that if you just thought it was going to be eating cotton candy and watching TV until Jesus came back, you might be wrong. You need to wake up. You might not like the way that this preacher is presenting it, but you need to wake up and realize that you might have to face some rough times before Jesus returns. That's the only point I'm trying to make. And now whenever those times come, while the spirit of Antichrist tried to exert more influence, hallelujah, God's people rose up. And in the cry of young David, who stood up in the face of the giant and said, is there not a cause? In the cry of the Hebrew boy who said, we will not bow. And in the cry of the same spirit of the Lord that might have, Mordecai would end up saying to Esther for such a time as this. Listen. It's always been that way. When God's people are faced with persecution, his spirit strengthens them and the remnant rises and stands bold in the face of the enemy. Amen. That's the word of the Lord right there. Look at this. Acts chapter 8 verses 1 through 4. You ready? Acts chapter 8 verses 1 through 4. The spirit of God. Listen, this is the story of Stephen the martyr. He's the first Christian in the Bible that we have recorded that died for the cause of Jesus Christ. He was just a deacon that was filled with the Holy Ghost and he was he was desiring to preach the gospel and he was going about doing the Lord's work. But then he was persecuted for what it was that he was doing for the Lord and he refused to back down. I don't, listen, this is one of the longest stories in the New Testament and I don't have time to get into it. But then Stephen the martyr began to preach the truth and the religious people came against him. And the word of God says that he called them out and he said, you crucified the Savior. And they gnashed on him. And literally, they bit him with their teeth. Wow. See, because the spirit of religion is demonic. Mm -hmm. It wants to hold people in control. And when the truth of Jesus Christ and him crucified is preached, it begins to bring liberty. It begins to bring freedom. It, wow. it begins to break chains of bondage. And guess what? The religious of heart, especially religious leaders, don't like that because they like, they don't even realize it half the time. But they like to hold people in bondage. But listen, at the end, Stephen refused to bow. He refused to consent. And it says right here that he was stoned to death. And in chapter 8, verse 1, Saul, before he was converted, it says Saul was consenting unto his death. Meaning, he said, it's okay for y'all to throw stones at Stephen. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which is at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. In other words, they mourned for his death. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. That word havoc means to cause people to become separated from their faith. He persecuted them so bad that people turned on the Lord because they were so fearful in the midst of the tribulation that was happening. He was entering into every house and he was hailing men, mean pulling them out of their homes and women, and he was throwing them into prison. Because of this persecution, they were scattered abroad. Believe this. And everyone went everywhere. They went preaching the word of God. The point that I'm trying to make is this, for such a time as this, that even in the midst of persecution, even in the midst of the worst of times, God's people have stood up under the anointing of the Holy Spirit to do the work of the Lord. And that's what Mordecai is a type of. He's a type of the believer that submits right. only to the Lord, but he's also a type of the spirit that would tell Esther, rise up for such a time as this, even in the face of danger, even in the face of persecution, God's people are called to serve him and to take a stand for what is right. Amen. Now, last week I made the point that Esther was concerned because she knew that she could possibly die if she just walked into the king's presence without permission. Right. 
Let's take a look at Esther chapter 4, and we'll be reminded of that. Esther 4, verse 12. Esther 4, verse 12. So she was concerned that she, if she just walked up in there because, see, you had to get permission from the king. I'm going to go somewhere with this because I'm here to tell you you got permission. Before I even get started, good, I want you to know you got permission to go into the presence of the Lord. Amen. But listen to me. She was concerned because in the physical, if you did not receive permission, you could be put to death. And it says that they told Mordecai Esther's words. Verse 13. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the other Jews. For if you all together hold your peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house shall be destroyed. And who knows whether you are come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. And look what she went on to say. Verse 16, she said this, go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also in my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mm -hmm. So I wanted you to see right there, because that's really my first point. My first point is having to do with the fact that she was go she desired to respond. But at the same time, she also called a fast. Point number one, humble yourself before the king. When I think of fasting, that is what I think of. I think of humility because at its heart, fasting describes self-denial. I've been hearing a lot of people talk about fasting and about repentance. And because we should be talking about fasting and repentance right now. I want to talk real quick about what fasting is and what fasting is not. Esther called the people to fast, and in times like these, God's people have always fasted. So what is the purpose of the fast? What is the fast and what is not the fast? First of all, I want you to know this. The fast is between you and God. A fast is not for men to see. It's not for you to try to impress others with your superior Spirituality. I don't know if you've ever met people like that before, but they want to tell everybody about how much they fast, about how much they pray, and about how spiritual they are. That's not what the fast is about. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 16 through 18. I want you to see what Jesus said about fasting. Matthew 6, 16 through 18. He says, moreover, when you fast... Be not like the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. See, they want everybody to know how spiritual they are. So they walk around with a long face, and they're all wore out. Don't get me wrong now, fasting can, can, can drain you physically. But he says they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. Now, I, for sake of time, I got to tell you that when Daniel fasted, he specifically said that he didn't anoint himself. You know why? Because the, because the truth of the matter is, is that a fast requires self-sacrifice. A fast requires uh, to, to, to sacrifice the flesh. A fast requires, that's what we're doing. If we're not eating or partaking of certain things, what we're doing is, is we're trying to deny our flesh. Because let me tell you, I'm just going to go ahead and preach this for a second. That whenever we don't fast, whenever we allow ourselves to be surrounded with the luxuries of life, it's easy for us to allow the luxuries of life to take the edge off, if you will. We can focus on all the cool stuff that we have and on food, on whatever it is that we're focusing on. But when we're coming to the Lord and we're, and we're calling a fast, what we're saying is I'm purposefully denying myself and then denying my flesh so that my inner man can become closer to the Lord. Amen. And what Jesus, but what, what the religious people would have done in, like they did in Jesus' day was that they saw, oh, David didn't anoint himself. So, or David, I'm sorry, Daniel anointed himself. I mean, he didn't anoint himself. And so they would take that and they would say, oh, I'm going to fast and I'm not going to anoint myself and I'm going to allow my face to look sad. Jesus said, no, don't do that. Because he 
see now you got the wrong spirit behind it. Yeah, right. You got the wrong spirit behind it. You're trying to let everybody know what you're doing. And you got, and you're not doing it for the right purpose. So a fast is supposed to deny your flesh so that your inner man can be closer to the Lord. You know what I call it? I meant to grab one, but you know what? It's perfect. I meant to grab a white towel, and I didn't have one, but I got a Kleenex right here. <laughs> and it's almost like this is how I get a fast. Hey, Lord, right. I'm trying to get your attention over here. God knows who you are. The Word of God says it. He knows how many heirs you have on your head. He pays attention when a sparrow falls to the ground. How much more would He be concerned of you? But when you fast, when times are of tribulation are upon you, when there's sickness everywhere around you, and you don't really know what to do, it's like, Lord, hey, I want, I'm trying to get your attention. I need your grace. Esther saying, Lord, I'm about to go into the King's presence, and I don't know what's going to happen because I wasn't invited. Would y'all please fast for me? And now my maids are going to fast because we want to get the attention. I will put my life in the hands of God. Lord, I need you to show up in this yes, situation. Lord. Yes, Lord. He says that you might not appear unto men to fast, but unto your Father which is in secret. And your Father which sees in secret shall reward you openly. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity to fast. For, for sake of time, I'm not even really going to turn there, but Joel, they talked about a fast. Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. Turn you me, to me with all of your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. I've taught people before that in the Jewish tradition, when they were mourning because they were losing everything around them and all kinds of bad things were happening, they would rip their clothing. And what the Holy Spirit is saying to the children of Israel, call a fast, humble yourself, but don't rip your clothes, rip your heart, allow your heart to be softened before the Lord. Allow your knee to be bowed before God. Don't come over here with this grand display. No, what I want you to do is I want you to give your heart to me. That's what the Lord would call out to us and say. Re call out to me. See, the vast denies the flesh so the inner man will focus on God. Amen. When we busy ourselves with those things, it causes us to forget that there are problems that need to be dealt with. She called a fast because it was very serious time and she needed God's grace to flow in her life. Once again, the fast is, an, is not, a, this is not what the fast is. It's not an attempt to earn God's grace. Jesus purchased that with his blood. The fast is almost like, once I, like I said, throwing up a white flag of surrender to God and saying, okay, Lord, it's bad. You got my attention. Now I really need yours for a minute. She was uncertain of what the end result would be, so she was humbling herself and putting herself in the hand of God. Look, I want you to see this. This is my next point. She was clothed, and she received favor. She needed something from the king, and he was willing to take care of the situation for her. That's point number two. She was properly clothed to enter the presence of the king. Esther chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Let's go ahead and read that real quick. She was properly clothed. Esther... Five verses one through five. It says right here. Now it came to pass on the third day, Esther put on her royal apparel. Oh, that's so good, Johnny. I don't know if you can see what I'm seeing here, but this is the word of the Lord. Amen. Esther was clothed in royal apparel. She stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king house and the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of the house, and it was so. When the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court, she obtained favor in his sight, and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near, and she touched the top of the scepter. I got to tell you, that's some good news right there, child of God. You might not be able to see what it is that I'm trying to tell you, but Esther had the proper clothing on in order to enter into the presence of the Lord. Let's take a look at Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 through 8, real quick. Revelation 19, verses 6 through 8. This is a lot, of, a lot of scripture this morning, but I'm just trying to give you the word of the Lord. Amen. It says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, 
For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed or clothed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. I got good news for you this morning, child of God. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you at the cross, the Word of God says in Galatians 3.27 that you've been baptized into Christ, and the Word of God says you have put him on. Another translation says you've been clothed in Christ Jesus. And I got even better news for you. Because you're clothed right, you're able to enter into the presence of the Lord. Look at this, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 and 20. Hebrews 10, 19 and 20. You ready? Here we go. This is what the word of the Lord says. You're clothed right. Now look at this. <laughs> because you're clothed right, you, got, you can have boldness. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. It's the blood of Jesus that clothed you in fine linen. It's the blood of Jesus, hallelujah, that allows you to enter into the presence of the Lord by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us. Through the veil, which is to say his flesh. What's wrong? We having technical difficulties. Yeah. We're not even broadcasting. Well, no. just not. It just just oh, all right. Oh well. We still have a church. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I'm not connected. Huh? So it's not that. It's not the Wi-Fi because I'm not connected. You I'm on data. Yeah. So we just got disconnected. It's and just, we're not on. Can you try to get back on? I don't know what to do. It's trying to reconnect. It said. That's a shame. Oh well. Oh, well, let's just keep preaching. That's the beauty of Christianity. Amen. God has prepared a way for his people to enter his presence so they can hear his voice and experience his power. Amen. All right. This is point number three. You ready? This is the point. Here we go. We're back up. All right. We're sorry. You didn't miss much. If we're back on, you didn't miss much. Really. Trust me. Okay. But in the story, Haman demands to be worshiped. And he gets more angry as his end draws near. And I got to tell you that this Haman type of Antichrist and this type of the enemy, the great dragon, when he knows that his time is nearing its end, he's going to get more angry and he's going to try to cause more persecution and more frustration upon the earth. I'm just preaching to you the word of God this morning. I'm not trying to incite fear. I'm not trying to tell you that this is where we are. I'm just trying to tell you what the word of the Lord says. Right. Right. Point number three. Our enemy craves to be exalted and he will become more forceful as we near the end. Look at Esther chapter five, verse nine. It says in Esther five, verse nine, right here. And then we're going to go to verse 13. It says, then went Haman forth that day joyful. See, he was invited to a banquet. Esther said, I'm going to have a banquet because she knew what Haman was doing. She knew that Haman was, was preparing to destroy all the Jews. And she was preparing a work on the other end to catch him in a trap. See, you got to understand something. Nothing's catching God by surprise. Even in your physical life today, whenever there's people that try to do you dirty at the workplace or whatever the case, you need to understand that Jesus is your strong tower. Jesus is your refuge. He is your rock. He is your salvation. And listen, the Lord, if you will trust him, will go to work for you and he will begin to prepare something on the other side that you could never even imagine. The, the enemy through other people might try to destroy your life, might try to mess you up. But listen to me, God's got your back. And even in the midst of all the confusion that will come on the earth one day, God's got another plan prepared. He's going to reverse the curse. Yes. Hallelujah. It says, so he left. So Haman's all happy. He's like, man, I got invited to Esther's party. And he left that day joyful with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate and that Mordecai stood not up nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. Look at verse 13. Yet all this avails me nothing. See, he's so frustrated because he's like, look, I got invited to the banquet. I'm being exalted. I've been given power by the king. But none of this is doing me any good so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Listen to me, child of God. I'm here to tell you that 
if this is the beginning of sorrows or whenever the beginning of sorrows happens and if we do have to face trial and tribulation before the rapture takes place I'm just I'm saying a bunch of ifs because we're just going to have to trust the Lord and watch as things go but right. let me just tell you this if we as the children of God have to experience persecution and tribulation what's going to end up happening is, is that at some point in time there's going to be a separation between the true church and the fake church I'm mm -hmm. telling you right now I can already see it the word of God says that they will begin to betray one another. I'm telling you right now that the spirit of Antichrist is already moving in the hearts of other people that call themselves believers and they're frustrated with other believers and because, because oh, you're not following the rules. Listen to me. I already told you that we should follow the rules. But whenever the rules begin to try to supersede what the word of the Lord says, and especially they try to get you to bow down one day, you better not listen to those rules. But there's going to come a day when you're going to try to make you bow down. And those people that call themselves Christian but aren't really Christian and instead are being led by the spirit of Antichrist, they're going to come against. And there's going to be a division that is caused. And they're going to begin to say, this avails us nothing and that these troublemakers are in the way and something is going to have to be done. I'm here to tell you right now that there is coming a day on this earth. I keep trying to explain it as best I know how. I'm not saying that we're there. But I'm here to tell you that there's going to come a day on this earth where there's going to be a separation. There's going to be a separation. And just like Moses drew a line in the sand, he's going to say, those that are for the Lord get on this side and the other people won't. And you got to be able to be prepared. You got to prepare your heart, child of God, to decide what side you're going to be on. And so that's what that's what Haman said. And listen, he, he, he said that he, he said, listen, I can't as long as this is going on, I'm not getting I'm not getting the glory that I want. None of this is working for me. And I want to now I want to turn with you. I want you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 12. This is where I'm going to get a little bit deep on you. We got about, you know, I keep saying this. I don't know if it's fair to do it to you or not, but I figure, hey, you don't really have anything else to do on a Sunday morning right now, right? Other than to stay with me <laughs> till, I'm in the, till I'm done with this message. I hope I haven't been putting you to sleep. Go Praise on, God. I'm trying to keep yeah. you. By the grace of God, we're trying to keep you passionate. But, but listen, I want, to I want to read to you Revelation chapter 12. And I want to tell you that in this chapter, I'm going to read a large portion of the scripture. There's a lot going on here. A lot going on here with end time events. I'm going to introduce a thought to you. And, but listen, I'm not going to introduce a thought to you without giving you some scripture to back it up and to tell you why I'm thinking what I'm thinking or what I'm seeing in the text. Now, whether or not you want to see it the way that I'm at, the way I'm trying to see it, I'm not, try, I'm not trying to tell you. Some people will preach, this is what this says. That's not the kind of preacher I am. I'm the kind of preacher that goes into the text and trust me, I'm turning over rocks and I'm looking under there and I'm going backwards and I'm comparing it to other scriptures. I don't even have time to break it all down for you, but I'm going to break some of it down for you and show you why I'm saying what I'm saying. But ultimately, in this passage of Scripture, we have a lot of end-time events taking place all at once. And ultimately, the context that I'm trying to share with you is that just like Haman towards the get closer to his demise, becomes more angry and tries to call the enemy closer to his demise is also going to cause more frustration. Amen. And so here it is in the word of the Lord. Look at this. Revelation 12, verse 1. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Now listen, I want real quick, I want to just, I just want to take a, a, a moment to go to Genesis chapter 37 because I want to try to prepare you for what I'm trying, for what we need to understand what this woman is right here. Amen. It says, let me, let me just remember what my scripture reference is that I'm using here. Genesis chapter 37 verse 9. Okay, you ready? Genesis 37 verse 9. I want, I'm trying to show you. What what I'm what I, the picture that I believe that this that what this is saying. So look what it says in, in Genesis thirty seven verse nine. This is Joseph having a dream. Now this is, we're getting kind of deep here. We're getting into the word of the Lord. I hope you like studying the Bible because I like teaching the Bible. 
and, and I want to dig a little bit. All right? Y'all ready? I know that this isn't a Wednesday night, but kind of just bear with me this morning. We'll give you a Wednesday and a Sunday all rolled into one. All right? So Joseph dreamed another dream, and he told it to his brothers, and he said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars obey, gave obeisance to me. That means to reverence him. That means to bow down before him. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother? So right here we have an interpretation of Joseph's dream. Him and his, Jacob is the sun. His mother is the moon. And his brother are the other 11 stars. And he says, Shall we bow down ourselves unto thee? Now, when we go back to the passage of Scripture where we are in the book of Revelation, what we see here is in Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, we see what the sign in the heavens was, was that there was a woman, amen, a woman in Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 and 3, and she was clothed. She was clothed with the sun, she was clothed with the moon under her feet, and upon her head were 12 stars. Let me just tell you, Joseph is a type of Jesus. Why? Because he's the suffering servant. Joseph suffered and was imprisoned for the cause of God. Jesus suffered for the cause of God. And what I'm here to tell you is, is that this woman, some people say that it's the Virgin Mary. It's not the Virgin Mary. This represents the nation of Israel. Amen. And she's pregnant. She's got a child. And she's travailing in birth. And she's in pain to be delivered. Now listen, sometimes you got to kind of like use, you got you to gotta be, be willing to be a, little, a critical thinker. I used to love Brother Larson, would always say that Christians are supposed to be thinkers. He may not always think the way I think, but he, like, he encourages thinking. So there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, there was a great red dragon. Who do you think that's talking about? That's talking about the devil. That's Haman in our story. All right. He has seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. We don't have time to get there, but the seven heads and the crowns represent kingdoms that have been in existence that under the spirit of Antichrist have been coming against God. The same spirit of Antichrist that was in Haman, that was in Nebuchadnezzar, all that has been in existence for all these thousands of years and has tried to exert authority over God. It's a system, but not only that, there will be a literal Antichrist. And he says that his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven. Talking about it, that most commentators or scholars will tell you that that's where we see that a third of the angels fell and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered. In other words, she was about to give birth and he wanted to devour her child as soon as it was born. Look at this, verse 5. She brought forth the man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Now what I'm trying to explain to you, I want to be real clear when, when I explain this, is that I'm proposing the possibility. Now I'm not asking your permission to do it. I'm just telling you what I'm doing. I'm proposing the possibility of this scripture being a rapture scripture. Now you can go back and you can determine exactly what that means in your own study. When, and then you can text me. I'll put my number up there if you want to text me. We can talk about it. What I'm trying to, I'm trying to make a point to you, though. Now, let me, let me just tell you. I'm not going half on, on a tangent. I'm, I'm here to tell you. She, who, how can this be a rapture scripture? Who is this man child? Well, the idea would be that here's Israel, right? Abraham. What did God do? God created a nation in Abraham, right? I've been drawing this, this graphic on the, on the screen a lot lately. God created a nation through Abraham, right? In the midst of a big old world. There was a big old world and there was no nation. There was no nation called Israel at the time, but God created a nation out of Abraham. Then from Abraham, what did he do? He gave us Jesus, right? That's what the Word of God says in the book of Galatians. So we know, and in Jesus, the church has been being birthed. So just bear with me. I got more scripture for you, so don't just, don't let me lose you. 
So what happened was, was that Israel gave birth to Jesus and Jesus gave birth to the church. So the man child, what I'm trying to say is, could be representative of the church being born in Jesus. Now, I'm not done yet because the next question would be, well, wait, hold on a second. How can that be when it says right here that she brought forth the man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron? That's obviously talking about Jesus and her child. Look at this. Her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So what about this rod of iron? Rod of iron, because let me tell you, there's plenty of scripture that denotes this as being Jesus, right? Psalm chapter 2, multiple scriptures. First of all, let me just do a little bit of teaching real quick. The word rod literally describes a scepter, kind of like the thing that Esther touched. It was a, it's the king's staff. And the word rule literally means to shepherd. It means to feed the flock. And so the idea here is, is that the man child is going to feed the world, but yet at the same time, it talks about that he will destroy those nations that come against. So there's going to be a time of judgment, but also at the same time during the millennial reign of Christ, hallelujah, people are going to be fed. Now listen to me. I want to give you, I want to give you a scripture real quick that I want to kind of talk, I want to kind of make a point for you. Oh, well, how could that be talking about the church? That doesn't make any, any, any sense. Well, let's look at this. Revelation chapter two. Verse 26 and 27. Revelation 2, verse 26 and 27. All right? Now, I'm not trying to tell you that I'm going to convince you, but I'm trying to make a point right here. Look at this. This is Jesus talking in the, in the, to the, to the, in the book of Revelation to the church. He says, He that overcomes keeps my works unto the end. To him will I give power over the nations. Look at this. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as I received of my father. What I'm trying to tell you is this is the word of the Lord. Jesus is saying that there's going to be an offspring of me that is going to follow me until the very end. And those that overcome until the very end, I will anoint them to rule and reign with me and they will lead with me just as I am going to lead. They will lead also along with me. That's the millennial reign of Christ. The word of God teaches that he has made us to be kings and priests unto our God because he redeemed us from every tribe, tongue and nation. Hallelujah. Through his precious Amen. blood. Now, listen, I'm not I'm not done quite yet. Because I want you to see this scripture right here. I wanted you to see that scripture in Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. Now, I find this to be very interesting. And I don't know if you feel the same way as me about things. Listen, I told you to come to the text exegetically. Pull out of. Don't look into. Look what it says right here. This word right here. You ready? She brought forth the man child who was to rule. And look at this. And her child. I don't know if this is going to work or not, but I'm going to try to highlight it. Her child was caught up unto God. I'm trying to highlight it right here. Boom. Her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Look at that word, caught up right there. Anybody know what that word is in the Greek? Caught up. Harpazo. Harpazo. Okay. So I want you to see this word right here. Now listen, this is what's so cool about my app. You ready? Boom, there it is. Harpazo, you can't see that. I don't know, can you, can you zoom in on that? Go ahead and zoom in on that. They don't need to see me. I'm trying to just, I'm trying to, I'm trying to share with you the truth of the gospel. This word in the Greek, harpazo. Look what, it, look what the literal meaning of the word is. It means to seize, to pluck, to take by force. Now listen, I'm going to press this button right here on my app, boom, and it's going to show you every single time this word is used in the New Testament. Thir you, know, you probably can't see that on the screen or whatever, but I'm here to tell you, 13 times this word is used in the Greek New Testament. All right, let me just describe to you real quick, because I, I, once I'm done with this point, we're moving forward fast. This is as deep as it gets right here. You still with me? I hope you're with me. All right. Because I'm trying to make a point. How could this be a rapture scripture? Well, look, look how this word is used. Matthew chapter 11. The violent take it by force. The idea is that it's something that's being seized. 
is being seized with force. That's what the that's what the idea of the word means. Here comes the wicked one. He catches away that which it seizes it by force. The wicked one harpazos the seed of the gospel out of the hand. It says Jesus perceived that they would come and take him by force, seizing him by force. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd who's owned the sheep or not sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf seizes them by force. Okay, well, look at this. It says right here that in, in Acts chapter eight, and when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord seized or caught away Philip and the eunuch saw him no more. He says, the, the apostle Paul says this, he says, I, I knew a man in Christ 14 years ago and such a one was caught up. He was seized into the heavenly realm. He was caught up into paradise. Look at this. First Thessalonians. This is really the one I wanted to see. Let's see if we can go to that right now. You ready? First Thessalonians chapter four. He says in verse 16, for the ark for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up, harpazo together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, I just want to make a point to you because, listen, <clears throat> I, try to, I, I try to think all this stuff through. I'm not just trying right. to, to, to tell you something because so I went back and I looked. So it says it, that he was taken by force. He was caught up by the hand of God and delivered away from the dragon that was trying to destroy. So people would say, well, that could be the ascension of Jesus, right? I mean, Jesus resurrected from the dead, and this could just be describing the ascension of Jesus. But that word is not used for that. That word in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in the Greek text, whenever it talks about Jesus moving, being brought away, it's not being used to that. Amen. And so let me just see here if I can even find the scripture. Right here, Luke chapter 24, verse 51. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Different word, and a Pharaoh. In the book of Acts, when it says that he ascended into heaven, completely different word. Because the word means to carry or to offer up. So the point that I'm trying to make is, is that with all of that being said, is, is that is it the possibility that this is descriptive of a rapture scripture? You can go ahead and, and go back to the uh, to the text where, you know, or, you know, you, you can kind of zoom out now is what I'm trying to say. And so basically what I'm trying to say is, is that now if this is a rapture scripture, you're going to have to go back and do your homework and see what exactly that means. But then he goes on to say this. This is really where I wanted to bring you. Because I wanted to talk to you about the end. I'm about to wrap this up. You ready? Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. I got good news for you. Haman can try to put God's people in prison. He can try to destroy God's people all he wants to. But when it's all said, all that Haman can do is kill your physical life. Well, well, that's pretty bad, preacher. Yeah, I get it. But the Word of God says in Hebrews chapter 2 that Jesus took upon himself flesh and blood so that he could destroy the power of death from the enemy because people had lived in fear all their life because of death. You have nothing to fear when it comes to death, child of God. And we need to get our mind wrapped around that truth now more than ever before. And if that's not popular preaching, guess what? My preaching was never popular to begin with. The Lord's been preparing me for such a time as this for a long time. The Lord's been reminding me, hey, you're not supposed to be fearing death. You're supposed to be keeping your eyes and your trust in me. And then no matter what you face to know, hallelujah, that I'm in control and that the end must come and that my plan will go forth. Hallelujah. See, the enemy prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth. 
and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation. You see, listen to me. Now has come salvation. There comes a, salvation has already been here for you individually. Yes. You understand that? Right. Jesus died on the cross. He said it is finished. Right. He gave up the Holy Spirit. He says it's expedient that I go to the Father so that he will come. Talking about the Holy Ghost. Yes. When the gospel is preached and you hear the good news of Jesus Christ and you hear that he died for you and you believe by faith in your heart and you confess with your mouth, you're forgiven of your sin. Hallelujah. And the Holy Ghost comes to live in your heart individually. You're saved. Salvation for you already rested upon your heart. Hallelujah. But listen to me. Ultimate salvation and fulfillment of the plan of God is going to come whenever Jesus can rule and reign upon the earth. Hallelujah. And thorn and thistle and decay and death are overcome and the last death with hell and Hades and all of that is going to come to an end. It says now now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. Look at this. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night. Won't you be happy to know that one day God is going to cast him out of heaven and that he will no longer be able to accuse you before the Father. Amen. Don't you got enough people accusing you on earth? Oh, help us, Lord. Enough of the accuser of the brethren. The, the, but one day, Jesus is going to, he's going to be defeated and he's going to be cast in the earth. Amen. And he's not going to be accusing you before your God anymore. But oh, Lord, look what it says. Verse 11, and they, who's they? I, you, you fill in the blank for yourself. You, you fill in the blank what it describes. They overcame him, talking about the enemy, by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony. Look at this part. And they loved not their lives unto death. All I'm trying to say is this. You better have your faith in the blood of the lamb. You better hold secure your testimony. And all I'm trying to say is don't love your life on this earth so much that you're not willing to give it over. Jesus was willing to give his life over for you. Amen. Will we ever have to face this? I don't know. I'm just preparing you. I'm just trying to hear speak the truth to you so that you would be prepared. Because listen, other Christians in the past have had to give their life for the cause of Christ. I can't say it enough times, but the Apostle Paul had his head cut off. I say it every week. Peter was crucified upside down. Mark was drugged through the streets of Egypt behind a chariot. Thomas was run through with an Indian sword. Listen, the list goes on and on and on. It says, verse 12, Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. See, when this happens, it's going to be bad. And of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. Just like Haman was frustrated. He didn't, Haman didn't even know really what was going on. It was, about to, it was about to pull a quick one on him. And just as the enemy thinks he's going to pull a quick one on God's people, look, the Lord's going to reverse the curse. The Lord's going to flip the script. And before you know it, that old lion, devil, the dragon, that serpent, hallelujah, he's going to be bound up and he's going to be burning in a lake of fire before it's all said and done. When the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Man-child was brought forth. Man-child was taken away. Now the woman is left. Who is the woman? Is Israel. Now the enemy turns his attention towards that woman. Here we go. We're about to wrap it up. You ready? So this is point number four. In the end, Satan will be destroyed and God's people will reign with Jesus. Like, I'm just going to tell you real quick the story. I'm not going to turn in Esther. But in Esther chapter 6, verses 1 through 12, the king couldn't sleep and he read the Chronicles. Y'all remember last week? You might not remember. But I told you, Mordecai did something good for the king. People were going to try to destroy the king. They were going to try to cause a coup. And Mordecai told about it and Esther told the king and the king had it written down in the chronicles what Mordecai had done amen and the way I connected that to the faith is that in the book of Jude it said for us to contend for the faith because it said that people were there there were lying preachers that were going to try to destroy the faith and try to destroy right. the gospel right. in the end days and that God has called his people to contend for the faith to hold strong to yes. the truth amen yes. and that Mordecai was protecting king and kingdom and that I know that God's bigger he's big enough to take care of himself but for whatever reason he's chosen to use lowly people like you and I right. in order right. to contend for the faith well he wrote right. it down in the chronicles and the king couldn't sleep one night and guess what he did 
He wrote, he read what was written. And you know what he read? He read that Mordecai the Jew saved the kingdom. Hallelujah. And guess what he did the next day? Oh, it's so good. Guess what he did the next day? He, Haman's coming over there all excited. He called Haman to come over there. And he said, he said, what do you think should be done for the person who has protected king and kingdom? How would I honor someone? If I, if I wanted to give honor to someone, what should I do? And, and Haman's over there, man. I like, I want to be honored. Yeah, 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 in his mind, he's like, man, I want some honor, boy. I want to be exalted because I'm the magnificent one, and I want to be <laughs> put over the top. And so this is what he said. He said, you should dress them in royal apparel. You should put the crown upon their head, and you should put them upon a horse, and you should lead them in front of all the people. Mm. And King Ahasuerus said, that's a perfect plan. I want you to put the royal apparel on Mordecai. I want you to put the crown on his head. I want you to put him up on a horse, and I want you to lead him around. Praise God. In front of all the people. Look, I'm going to feel the Holy Ghost on that one because, listen, it gets even better because then Haman shows up to the banquet, and Esther calls him out. And when it's all said and done, King Ahasuerus, you see, he, see uh, Haman had prepared gallows for Mordecai to be hung upon the gallows. And the king turns around, and he says, Hang him on the gallows that he had prepared for, the, for Esther's people. I'm here to tell you that I got good news because in the end, God wins. Hallelujah. Amen. Revelation 19.9, for sake of time, I'm just going to read some of it to you. He says unto me, right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, these are the true sayings of God. Revelation 5, 9 and 10. They sung a new song saying, you are worthy to take the book to open the seals thereof, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And you've made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. See, the king put a crown on the head of the faithful one, Mordecai. Revelation 2.10. For none of those things which you shall suffer Fear, I'm sorry, fear, none of the, well, let's go ahead and go to the scripture on this. This is important right here. These last scriptures right here. Y'all ready? Ready. All right, hang in there with me. Come on, somebody. We got one person that's hanging in there. Hope y'all didn't all fall asleep at home. He says in Revelation 2.10, fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried and you shall have tribulation 10 days. Be thou faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Let's look at James chapter one, verse two. James chapter one, verse two. My brother, count it all joy when you fall into various temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. I'm, I, I, I kind of went a little bit further. Let me, let me find my little scripture again. It's James chapter 1, verse 12. The trying of your faith works patience. James 1, verse 12. Here we go. Blessed is the man that endures the trial. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Praise God. Last thing that I want you to be aware of right here. I'm just going to read them to you. Revelation 20 verses 1 through 3. See, just like Haman had a plan and he ended up hung with a noose around his Come neck. <laughs> Hallelujah. God's about to finish yeah. off this lion dragon. It says in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid a hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. Listen to me, what that's talking about is the millennial reign of Christ. It's talking about the fact that Jesus one day is going to return at the end of the great tribulation at the end of the time of wrath and he is going to smite the nations and he is going to literally set up his throne in Jerusalem and he's going to rule and reign from this earth hallelujah and those that overcome with him until the end will receive the crown of life and they will rule and reign with him because he purchased them with his precious blood and he made them to be priests and kings to serve with him to rule and to reign with him and they will rule and reign with him for a thousand years and then there will be a short period listen to me I wish I had time to really break it down for you 
Well, let me just say this real quick. When you see the Lord, the word of God says you, when you see him, you will become as he is. What that means is whether you be in the rapture or whether you, go, you die and be with the Lord, when the time is right, you're going to receive a glorified body. During the millennial reign of Christ, there will be some that have glorified bodies. There will be some that don't have glorified bodies. Mankind will continue to repopulate over a thousand years. That means that there's going to be a mixture of different kinds. Of, I mean, I'm just telling you what I, I'm just telling you what I believe to be truth of the Word of God. There's going to be people that repopulate that don't have a glorified body, and there's going to be people that do have glorified bodies. And the King's going to be on the earth. And instead of the spirit of Antichrist being the controlling power, it's going to be the spirit of the Christ. And, and the wolf is going to lie with the lamb. And the child's going to be able to put their hand on a snake's hole. And the, the, and the lion's going to eat grass like an ox. And there's going to be peace over all the earth. Because it's going to be a millennial reign of Christ. Amen. And God's people are going to rule and reign with him. Hallelujah. Amen. And, and, and I got to tell you that there's going to be a short period of time whenever the enemy's going to be loosed. Why would he be loosed? Because there's going to be people that still need to that have to make a choice for themselves. And during that time frame, people will still be preaching Jesus. Yeah. He still will bear the nail scars in his hand. He still will bear the, the scar in his side. And the story will still be told that he laid his life down for people to be purchased. And Amen. people will still have to make a choice. And after that thousand years is over, Revelation 20 verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever.